Welcome to lecture seven on Mobius circles. In lecture six, we introduced Mobius transformations. And uh, here I want to give you a um, suggestion to go and check uh, this YouTube video on uh, Mobius transformations, Mobius transformations revealed, where you can visualize with, with very nice pictures what uh, these uh, Mobius transformations do to the complex plane and more generally to the Riemann sphere. In lecture six, we also introduced Mobius circles. They are a um, common term for either a Euclidean circle or, or a Euclidean uh, line. And we have seen a very important property, namely that if T is a Mobius transformation, and see a Mabius circle. Then T of C, the image of C under T is also a Mabius circle. Okay, so uh, we have used and we will use also in this lecture the, the convention that we take uh, the point at infinity on C if C is a Euclidean line. Euclidean line. Okay, so you can say that the maybe circles containing the point at infinity are exactly Euclidean lines. Now, uh, today we want to address the following uh, problem, which um, is a natural problem once we know that um, maybe transformation sends maybe circles to maybe circles. Namely, given now two maybe circles. What we want to do is to ask, is there a Mabius transformation sending C1 to C2? And if there is, let's find all of such transformations. So we want to describe all Mabius transformations, put CT in M, such that T of C1 is equal to C2. Okay, so this is uh, the problem we want to uh, solve today. And to solve this problem, the following remark will be very useful. And this is a remark from Euclidean geometry. And namely, if you have three distinct points, Z1, Z2, Z3 on the Riemann sphere, then if they are distinct, there is exactly one maybe circles passing through this point and there exists a unique C such that these three points Z1, Z2, Z3 lie on this circle. Okay, this is a result in Euclidean geometry. So for example, if Z3 is um, the point at infinity, then you can just, just take a line passing through Z1 and Z2. If Z1, Z2, and Z3 are all in C, if they are collinear, then you, you also find a line. If they are not collinear, then you know that you can find a Euclidean circle passing through these three points. So this is a result uh, known to you. And why are we now interested in, um, in this result? Because of the following proposition. This proposition tells us that if we take two pairs of, sorry, um, two triples of uh, points, so if now we have one triple Z1, Z2, Z3, which are distinct and 
another triple uh, W1, W2, W3, which are also distinct. Then uh, there exists a Mabius transformation sending the first points to the second point. So T of Z J is equal to W J for J equal to one, two, and three. Okay, so this means if we have these three points here, Z1, Z2, and Z3, and we have the other points W1, W2, and W3, then we will find some T sending the first point to the first point, second point to the second point, and the third point to the third point. Okay, so this is what we are claiming here. So let's give the proof of uh, this result. So we do first a special case. So assume first that the points W1, W2, and W3 are special. And namely, let's take W1 equal to zero, W2 equal to one, and W3 equal to the point at infinity. Now, if Z1, Z2, and Z3 are uh, different from um, the point at infinity, so if they, are, they lie in C, then it's easy to find uh, the required um, uh, transformation because what I want is that the first point Z1 goes to zero. Uh, so then I can take simply Z minus Z1 in the numerator of my um, Mabius transformation. On the other hand, I want the third point, Z3, to go to infinity. So I can divide by, by Z minus Z3. Now the, the last point missing this is the point Z2. And you see, if I take this definition, the point Z2 goes to Z2 minus Z1 over Z2 minus Z3. So what I want to do now is to normalize by multiplying by the inverse of this number. So Z2 minus Z3 over Z2 minus Z1. So this is the required map. So now it's easy if you uh, substitute uh, Z equal to Z1, you see that uh, you get zero, Z2 you get one, and for Z3 you get infinity. So this is uh, when Z1, Z2, and Z3 are in C. So what happens if one of these points is not in C? So in this case, you can also easily write a map. So if Z1, for example, is infinity, then what we can do we can take the map written just, just here. So let me maybe, let me maybe um, put this map here inside the box. So this is a um, very important definition. So if Z1 now is infinity, what I want to do is I want to take uh, the, the uh, formula in the box and I want to get rid of the two terms. So this term here and this term here, where there is Z1. And what's left is exactly what, um, what I want. So Tz, now I can take it to be Z2 minus Z3 over Z minus Z3. Also, you see uh, in this case, the map T has exactly the required uh, properties. So if instead Z2 is equal to infinity, I just do the same, the same trick as, as before. I take uh, the formula in the box and I, I get rid of the, of the two terms here on the right where there is Z2. So this 
gives me z minus z1 over z minus z3. And <clears throat> last case, if z3 is infinity, take t of z equal to z minus z1 over z2 minus z1. Okay, so and you see in uh, by direct uh, inspection that uh, these maps uh, have the property that send z2, z2, z, uh, z1, z2, and z3 to 0, 1, infinity. So this solves the case where uh, we have this choice of w's. In the, in the general case, is also um, uh, follows by what we uh, just show. So if now w1, w2 and w3 are arbitrary. Then we take first t1, bringing z1, z2, z3 to 0, 1, infinity, which we know exists by the first part, and t2 bringing W1, W2, W3 to 0, 1, infinity, which also we know exists by the first part. Now, if we want to bring Z1, Z2, Z3 to W1, W2, W3, we just uh, consider T, which is defined as first doing T1 and then doing the inverse of T2. And this, we know it's a map, which is a Mabius map, because we know that Mabius maps are closed under composition. This we showed in the last uh, lecture. Uh, it's clear that this map has the required property. So if I now take T of um, Z1, for example, this is the same of T2 inverse of T1 of Z1. By definition of T1, this is equal to T2 inverse of zero. And now by definition of T2, since W1 goes to zero, the inverse brings zero to W1. And similarly for the others, for Z2 and Z3. Okay, so this ends the uh, the proof of this uh, proposition. So you see for every two triples of points, we can find a maybe a transformation bring, bringing the first triple to the second triple. So here there is another question, is this map unique? And we will see uh, that we can answer uh, this question. So the question is now, is the map in proposition one unique? Uh, so to answer this question, we need uh, we need a, uh, a lemma and a definition. So we need a definition and a lemma. So a definition is the definition of a fixed point. So we say that Z, an element in the Riemann sphere, is a fixed point for T if when I apply um, T to Z, I, bring, I get back Z. So this point is fixed by the map. So when I apply uh, T to it, I get back the same point. So now let's see how many fixed points can we have for a Mabel's transformation. So this is the, the crucial um, observation. So this we show in this lemma. T is the identity map, every point is fixed. So in some sense we want to avoid this case. So let's take T maybe a transformation and, and T is different from the identity map. Now, under this hypothesis, if A minus D squared plus four BC is equal to zero, remember these are the coefficients in the um, representation of the Mabius transformation, then T has exactly one fixed point.
if we are not in this case, so if a minus d squared plus 4bc is different from zero, then t has exactly two fixed points. Okay, so this is what we want to uh, we want to show. So here it's convenient to make a case distinction. So we first consider t to be a homotity. So t and m homotity. So this is the first case, and we know that t is different from the identity. So in this case. Uh, we know that T of uh, infinity is equal to infinity. This is how we defined uh, the value of T at infinity. So infinity is a fixed point. Now let's look for fixed points among the complex numbers. So now uh, Z in C is fixed. This happens if and only if t of z equal. What is this equation? Let's let's write this equation down. This equation now is a over d z plus b equal to z. It's a linear equation, so we can uh, solve it easily. Um, this brings us to d minus a times z equal to b. And here you see we have a solution uh, if d minus a is different from zero. So uh, this unique solution, uh, if and only if a is different from d, okay? Because when a is equal to d and b is different from zero, so in this, in this other case, then no solutions. If A equal to D and B is equal to zero, well, in this case, T is the identity. So we already um, uh, get rid of this case. So in this case, we have A different from D. And uh, this corresponds to the fact that um, now since C is equal to zero, uh, this uh, is um, if and only if A minus D squared, this is different from zero. So if we add BC, this also must be different from, from zero, not because C uh, uh, is um, equal to zero, so recall C equal to zero in this case. So if A is equal to D, we just get one solution, this is the one uh, fixed point this is infinity. If A is different from D, uh, we get uh, two solutions, one at infinity and one, uh, it's a complex number. So this is the first part. Now let's take T uh, fractional. So in this case, uh, infinity is never a fixed point because T of infinity is A over C. Oh, this is a complex number. Uh, so not fixed. And Z now in C is fixed. If and only if T of Z equal to Z. Well, in this case, we get a different um, equation. So in this case, a z plus b over c z plus d must be equal to z. And um, if we get rid of um, denominators, we get here the condition c z squared plus d minus a z minus b equal to zero. So you see now this is a um, quadratic equation. And we know that quadratic equations um, have either um, 
one or two solutions, depending on the discriminant of this equation. So we have the discriminant criterion. So um, one solution if the discriminant, which is um, the coefficient of z, d minus a squared minus four times coefficient of z squared times uh, the, the constant. So in this case is four times c times minus b is equal to zero. And this is exactly the condition we saw in the statement. And uh, two solutions otherwise. Okay, so have the same uh, conclusion. So this number d minus i squared, d minus a squared plus four bc gives us a criterion to say if uh, we have one or uh, two fixed points. Anyway, what we see is that the number of fixed points, if we are not the identity, is at most two, either one or two. Very good. So this is um, then the, the finishes the proof of this uh, small uh, lemma. And now we can use uh, this lemma to show that the map in proposition one is unique. This is proposition two. So uh, the map in proposition one is unique. So if we now take two, maybe a transformation such that T1 of Z of Z, J is equal to WJ and T2 of ZJ is equal to WJ for J equal to one, two, and three. Then what we can do, we can take T to be T2 inverse of T1. So this is, again, a maybe transformation by the, um, what we saw last time. And this has, has now three fixed points. And T of Zj is equal to T2 inverse of T1 of Zj. And this is T2 inverse of wj, and this is zj. Now this, this works for j1, 2, and 3. So this map, t has three fixed points, at least. This means that t is equal to the identity map. Which means that um, which means that T two inverse of T one of Z is equal to Z for all Z, which is the same as saying that by taking T two both sides that T one of Z is equal to T two of Z for all Z. Okay, and this shows the two the two maps are the same, and this finishes the proof of. Uh, um, proposition uh, two. Okay, so now we uh, understood uh, what happens when we apply a Mebius map to three points. So we can map these three points to an arbitrary other triples of point and the Mebius map doing this is unique. Now let's go back to um, our uh, problem. So recall that we want to to show that given two Mebius circles, we have uh, a Mebius transformation bringing one to the other and actually want to find all of them. Finding one now is not, um, it's not a difficult task. So from what we, we have shown so far, we see that if C1 and C2 
R, let's call this theorem one maybe, if C1, C2 are maybe circles, there exist maybe a transformation such that T of C1 is equal to C2. Let's prove this uh, statement. So we take Z1, Z2, and Z3 on the first circle, three arbitrary points, so distinct. And we take also three points on the second circle, distinct. Now by proposition one, uh, there exists T, bringing the first three points to the second a triple of points, J1, to 3. Um, this means that T of C1 is a maybe circle This we know from the last lecture that the image of a maybe circle is a maybe circle. And this maybe circle passes through W1, W2, and W3. By the remark we made before, there is just once maybe a circle passing through these three points, and maybe this is C2. So by the remark, TC1 is equal to C2. Because both these maybe circles passes through the same triple of points. Very good. So now we have uh, established this existence result. Before moving far, far, uh, um, uh, forward, let's make an example, which is extremely important. Let's take two maybe circles, so particular ones. So consider the first one is the unit circle, so these are, this is K01, so these are the points with distance one from the, um, from the origin. This is the first maybe circle, the second maybe circles, we take a line, the real line. So this is R union with a point at infinity. Okay, so let, maybe let's, let's draw them. Okay, so this is the, um, the circle, and then here we have the line, something like this. So this first one here is K01, and here we get R. And um, now we have the point at infinity here somewhere. Now what we want to do, we want to find a maybe a transformation bring the first circle to the second one. According to what uh, we've, uh, we have just seen, it's enough to take three points on the first circles, three points on the second circle, and then bringing one to the other. So as three points in the first circle, let's choose, for example, the point one, the point i, and the point minus one on the first circle. And on the second circle, let's take, for example, the point zero, the point one, the point infinity. So here I have the point one, and here I have the point zero. Then I have here the point I, and here the point one. And finally, I have the point minus one, and here I have the point at infinity. So now we have already seen a recipe to bring the first three points to the second uh, three points. No? So this was, was given, recall, 
here in this uh, red box. So let's use exactly this formula because now you know that the points W1, W2, and W3 are exactly zero, one, and infinity. So if we use this formula, then um, the desired map, or maybe let's say the map T of Z, what was the formula? So Z minus the first uh, point, one. Below we have Z minus the third point. The third point is minus one, so we get Z plus one. And then here we get um, the second point, I minus one times I plus one. And here just observation that this number is equal to minus i, as you can easily see. So basically we have found the Mabius transformation minus i z plus i divided by z plus one. Uh, this has the property that brings k zero one to r union infinity. Very good. And here I want also to make, um, to make uh, a remark. And the remark is that um, it's also interesting to see what happens to the other points in the complex plane under this map T. So you see K, K01 divides the complex plane in two parts. We have the interior of the disk, which now here is in yellow. And then we have the exterior of, of the disk. The question now under the map T, where does the interior and the exterior go? And to do, uh, to do this, so we see that um, either the interior goes in the upper half plane and the exterior goes in the lower half plane or the other way around. And to, to decide in which case are we, we just need to take one additional uh, point. For example, let's take Let's take the point here as the origin. And we have to understand where the origin goes. And this is easily seen from the formula. So uh, T of zero is equal to minus I times zero plus I divided by zero plus one this is equal to I. So we see that zero goes to I which is a point in the upper half plane. Therefore, we know that the, the whole disk uh, on the left side goes to the upper half plane. And consequently, the, the exterior of the disk goes in the, in the lower half plane. Here, also another remark, you can also understand uh, this in terms of orientations of the circles. So you see on the left, we can give an orientation by going from the first point to the second point, then to the third. So you get something like this. And then given this orientation, we know that the green part is on the right side and the yellow part is on the left. Now this orientation on the circle can be seen also um, on the other side. So here we go from the first point to the second, from the second point to the third, and so on. So also here you see that the green part is on the right and the yellow part is on the left, according to this orientation. So you, uh, you see a general fact, which you don't, we don't prove here, that this Mabius transformation preserve this, always this orientation. Very good. So. This was a very in, uh, important uh, example. And uh, now let's uh, go back to, to problem one. So we know that there exists T in M with T of C1 equal to C2. 
And now we want to find all of them. Let's find all such transformations. Also here, it's enough to solve a particular case. So enough to solve a particular case. The particular case in which we, uh, in which we take, let's call this problem two, in the particular case, we take C1 and C2 equal to the unit uh, circle. So find all T in M with T of the unit circle equal to the unit circle. So if we know how to solve this problem, then uh, we know how to solve also um, problem one. So let's observe this first. So if we can solve problem two, uh, then if I have now an element bringing C1 to C2, which is arbitrary, any such element is of the form T3 composed with T2 composed with T1, where T1 brings um, its particular one bringing C1 to K01. So here it says it's just a particular one. We just need to find one and we know how to do it. Then T2 is now arbitrary. Bringing, bringing uh, K01 to itself. And here this, uh, we know how to do it provided we can solve problem two and now we will so we'll see how we can solve problem two. And T3 brings back K01 to um, C2. Uh, so this is a particular with T of K01 equal to C2. Okay, so also here one can um, do maybe a picture. So if you have C1 here and uh, C2 here, two maybe circles, the idea is to bring, to put here in the middle, um, to put here in the middle the unit circle. This is K01. And then every maybe transformation between these two can be written as the composition of um, a particular one going from C1 to K01. So this is T1. Then one maybe transformation bringing this uh, to itself. This is T2. And a particular T3 bringing K01 to C2. This um, you will see um, more in detail this in the uh, exercise, but it should be also clear already from here that it's enough to treat the case uh, described in problem two where C1 and C2 are equal to K0, one. Okay, so let's solve now problem two. This will be the last thing we do in this part of the lecture. So let's solve problem two. So we have here also two cases. So we know that T must bring the unit circle to unit circle. And now the question is what happens to the complement of this unit circle? So you saw here, the unit circle has an inside. This is D 
one zero and outside the outside is the um, annular region one infinity center at zero union the point at infinity okay so we now have two cases according to uh, the fact that um, t of d one zero is equal to d one zero so these two ex exterior and interior part are fixed no? so in this case also obviously implies t of the annulus is sent to the annulus. And the second case in, instead is where the two regions are interchanged. So we do here case A, case B is um, for you in the exercises, but it's really um, similar to what we do uh, here and actually can be derived from what we do here and the composition with the inversion one over Z. So let's do now only case A. We do case, case A or case B in the exercise. So let's, um, let's see um, what we want to, to do. So the first thing is that we want um, to ask that T of the disk is sent to the disk. So T of the disk is the disk. So this condition is equivalent to the condition that the center of the disk is sent the disk. What does it mean? This means that T of zero must have norm less than one. And if we um, uh, recall the definition of a Mabius transformation, T of zero is just B over D. So this means here that B over D must have norm less than one. Very good. So this implies in particular that D must be different from zero. Otherwise, this P over D would be infinite and surely doesn't have norm less than one. And you know that once we have a Mabius transformation, we can always normalize the coefficients by, for example, dividing by the same non-zero number. So um, we can take D equal to one and uh, this means that the, this inequality here becomes that B as norm less than one. Okay, very good. So this is the, um, the first uh, thing. The second thing now we want that, um, we want that T of K zero one is equal to K01. So let's see uh, how we can uh, rewrite this. So this can be rewritten by asking that the norm of A times E to the I theta, E to the I theta is a, is a general point in, uh, on the unit circle, plus B over C times E to the I theta plus one. This has, has to have norm one. And this should, should all for all theta real numbers. Okay, so now we have this uh, norm. We can, uh, as usual, get rid of denominators and we also square everything so that we can use the definition of the norm squared in terms of uh, um, multiplication by complex numbers. So um, if we do this, we get um, to the equation a squared plus b squared. And then um, 
minus c squared minus one. So we already brought the relevant part on the left side. And then on the uh, right side, we have two times the real part of c minus um, minus a b conjugate e to the i theta. And this must hold for all theta in R. Okay, just here, just by uh, squaring both sides. Both sides. Okay. Uh, claim that the, uh, the number C minus A, B conjugate is zero. So we claim C minus A, B conjugate is equal to zero. Let's prove this by contradiction. If not, then C minus A, B conjugate is R times E to the I phi for some R positive and some phi real number. So now if we substitute um, back in the equation, so this implies that uh, a squared plus b squared minus c squared minus one is equal to two r and then the cosinus of phi plus theta. And this also must hold for all theta in R. Okay, so I just substituted, I just substituted here the, um, the value uh, for C minus AB conjugate that we found, that we found here. Okay, but now uh, you see in this, in this equation here, the, the left hand side doesn't depend on theta, but the right hand side does depend on theta. So this means that this is already a contradiction. So we can um, see that the uh, left hand side of this equation does not depend on theta, but the right hand side does. And this is a, a contradiction. So we find that C minus AB conjugate is equal to, to zero. So we get Um, that uh, the conditions, we get the condition um, uh, the conditions, uh, what was it? D one zero equal to, to D One zero um, this um, here is equivalent to the fact that B had norm less than one, C is equal to A B conjugate, and then um, we have in in this equation here, therefore the right hand side is equal to zero. So now also the right hand side must be equal to zero. So a squared plus b squared minus c squared minus one equal to zero. Okay, so very good. So, so here may, maybe I make a small, um, a small correction. Uh, so T D one zero equal to D one zero implies only T zero is in D one zero. Okay, so it's not, 
uh, is not equivalent thing. Okay, very good. So now we have uh, these uh, three conditions and uh, you see now C can be substituted in the last one. And if I substitute C in the last one, what I get is norm A squared minus one times norm of B squared minus one. This is by substituting C equal to AB conjugate in the equation A squared plus B squared minus C squared minus one equal to zero. Now we know that B has norm less than one. So this last term is different from zero. So this means that A squared must be equal to one. So norm squared of A must be equal to one. So we get the equivalent conditions, norm of B less than one, C equal A B conjugate, and the last a in norm must be equal to one. So uh, we are uh, basically almost done. So uh, this means that a is equal to i theta for some theta. Then uh, um, we can uh, find now b from uh, the second equation b is um, B is given by C conjugate times A conjugate inverse, but A conjugate inverse is equal to A because A has norm, has norm one. So here we can get rid of this. And the last uh, condition that we know that B is of norm less than one, but now we can rewrite this by saying that C as norm less than one. Because B and C have the same norm because A as norm one. So we have these, we have found this, uh, these conditions. And these actually are exactly the conditions we want. So now if we are given A, B and C with these conditions, then we have the Mabius transformation which preserves the unit uh, disk. So let me put this in a theorem. This is theorem two. T is a Mabius transformation sending the disk to itself. If and only if T of Z is equal to e to the i theta times z plus z0 over z0 conjugate times z plus one for some theta in R and some z0 in the unit disk. Why is that so? So, from this uh, equation, so from the uh, conditions in the red box, box we know that um, T of Z is equal to E to the I theta times Z plus B, but B is C bar times E to the I theta over C Z plus one. Okay, so this is E to the I theta times Z plus C bar C Z plus one. And now C as norm less than one. So to find the formula we given in the statement of the theorem, we just have to take Z zero equal to the um, conjugate of C to get the formula in the statement. OK. 
Okay, so this finishes the proof of uh, theorem two. So what we have done is theorem two, we have found all the Mabius transformations preserving the unit disk. And these are of this type, e to the i theta times z plus z zero over z zero conjugate times z plus one. So you see these are, you can see also as a composition of two maps, this Mabius transformation and the Mabius transformation given by, given by a rotation by angle theta. We will see in, in the next part of the lecture how important are these type of uh, uh, transformations. Okay, thank you for the attention.